I have a confession to make. Just a few years ago, I was really insecure about how little I knew about Git. I think part of the problem was that the tutorials that I was following were overly complicated. You don't need to know what a Merkle tree is or even who Linus Torvalds is to be productive with Git, but you do have to be productive with Git. So this is just enough Git to be productive. So who is this video for? Well, this video is for those who are yet to get their first job in tech and those who have recently landed their first job in tech. I'm going to make a couple of assumptions. The first assumption is that you have a GitHub account. And then the next assumption is that you have Git installed. If you don't have either of these things, now is a great time to pause the video and go get them sorted. So here's just a few notes about the video. Firstly, there's different flows that you can use with Git. The most popular ones are going to be trunk, Git flow, and GitHub flow. We're not going to cover these in this video because that would be an entirely different video. Secondly, Git and GitHub are not the same thing, but we're going to be using both. And then lastly, we're going to be using the command line and the GitHub VS Code extension. If you don't have the VS Code extension installed, you can go over to extensions, search for GitHub, and then install this extension here. We're going to be using both because the command line is much faster and you should get comfortable using the command line with Git. And then secondly, it also gives you a lot more output. We're also going to be using the VS Code extension because it gives you a good visualization of what's happening. There's different terms that we're going to be using throughout the video. I'll explain what each one of these means as we go along, but if you get stuck, here are some of these terms here. So firstly, what is Git? Well, Git is a version control system that allows you to track changes in your code base over time. It enables you to collaborate with team members on the same code base, and it allows you to collaborate with lots of team members. Git will scale across teams that have hundreds, even thousands of developers. You can easily revert to a previous version of your code and experiment with new features. And it also provides a record of all the changes that your code base has gone through over time. I'm gonna to center this video around the different problems that you're going to want to solve with Git instead of centering it around the commands. This is because it's going to make it easier for you to remember what you need to do as you come across these problems. And then lastly, throughout the video, I'm going to be giving you some pro tips. Here are those pro tips here, but I'm gonna add a little bit more context as we go throughout the video. So the first thing that we're going to wanna to do is to create a new repository. So let's go over to GitHub and create a new repository. So you can see that we have this big green button here that says new repository. We also have a plus symbol here with a drop down and I'm going to click new repository here. I'm going to change the owner of this to Tom Does Tech. Make sure that you've changed this to your personal account if you're just playing around. Otherwise, if you create it in your organization's account, you might have to send an embarrassing message to somebody. So I'm gonna call mine just enough. Git. I'm going to make mine a public repository and then all of this sort of stuff here, I'm just going to leave that alone. I'm gonna click create repository. And you can see that GitHub gives us the commands that we need to initialize our Git repository. So I'm gonna pin this to the side here so we can have a look at it as we follow it along. So I'm gonna open up a new terminal. And then the first thing I'm gonna do in the terminal is git init. And git init is going to create a .git folder. So if we ls here, you can see that we only have a readme. If we do ls minus a and show our hidden folders, you can see that we now have a .git folder. You're never gonna to need to touch this folder, but you just need to know it's there. The next thing we want to do is to add our file to our stage. So I'm gonna say git add dot, and git add dot is going to save all of your files that have changes into your stage. So if we open up the source control extension here, you can see that we have our staged changes here. And this is going to include the entirety of this readme. If we remove this, we can add it again. So we can say git add, and then we can add a single file by putting the path to that file here. This is in the root directory, so it's just going to be its name. You can see that we've now staged that change again. The next thing we'll want to do is to make a commit. And making a commit is like taking all of your stage changes, wrapping them up into a ball with a label, and then we can push that ball out to our remote repository. So let's say git commit minus m. I'm just going to call this first commit. So you can see here that we've made one commit. We get the hash of the commit here. We get the name, and then we get a status of what it is that we changed. So you can see that we added one file and it has 65 insertions. 
So the next thing we want to do is to set our branch and we also want to name that branch. So I'm going to say git branch minus m main and minus m main is just us naming the branch main. So the next thing we want to do is to tell git where is our remote origin for this repository. And we can do that with this command here. So git remote add origin and then we're going to specify the path to our remote origin here. And you can see that our path is actually GitHub in the URL up here. So then the last thing we want to do is to push our changes up to our remote origin. So I'm going to say git push minus u origin. So we want to push to our origin and then we want to push to our main branch. So if we come back over to GitHub here and we refresh this page, you can see that we now have our code here. And the only thing that we have here is our readme file. Okay, so we're ready to start adding features to our code base. I want to check out onto a new branch so I can keep my changes isolated. I can get those changes reviewed. And then finally, I can merge them into our main branch. So I'm going to say git checkout and then minus B because I want to create a new branch. If I want to check out into a branch that already exists, I'll remove the dash B and I'm going to call this feature slash index. So you can see here we've switched to a new branch feature slash index and VS code is telling me that down here that we're on feature slash index. Okay. So let's create a new folder and I'm just going to call this a source folder. Let's add an index.html and we can just add some HTML to this page here. Okay, this is perfect. Now let's make a commit. So I'm going to say git add and I want to add everything. If we go here to our source control, you can see that we have our changes here. So I'm going to say dot add. Now that we have our index inside of our stage changes, we can make a commit. So I'm going to say git commit minus M. And now I'm going to say feet index page. So this feet here is just short for feature. And this is what we call a semantic commit. There's different types of semantic commits that you can make. One is a feature, one is a chore, one is a test, and one is a refactor. And there's a few different ones as well. It is a good idea to get into the habit of prefixing all of your commits with this. And this is going to get, make sure that you have really nice change logs. Okay, so now that we've made a commit, we can git push. And git is going to tell us that the current branch has no upstream branch. So we need to say git push upstream, and then we need to set the upstream to origin and then feature index. So I'm going to say git push minus set upstream origin feet slash index. And you can see here in GitHub, it is suggested that we create a pull request. So let's go ahead and do that. So you can see that we have our title for our pull request and we have some comments here and we can write markdown inside of these comments. So one of my pro tips is to add a descriptive comment to your pull request. And there's a certain language that we use when we create pull requests. So I like to create dot points and I like to start with ads and then I'm going to say what it adds. So I'm going to say ads index page. And then you can add some notes down here as well about what it is that your pull request is going to do. That's not going to do much, so we don't need to put too much in here. So let's go ahead and create this pull request. So you'll see over here that we have our reviewers and GitHub will often suggest some reviewers for you. And it's usually pretty accurate, but you can tag the reviewers here and then you can ping them on Slack or Discord or whatever you use and ask them if they can please review your pull request. Once you get your feedback and you make your changes, you can finally merge your pull request here. So let's go ahead and do that. And you can see that I get an option to delete my branch. So I'm just going to delete that branch because I'm no longer going to use it. Now let's go back to our code base and you can see that our changes are now inside of our main code base. Okay, so when we go back to VS Code, you can see that we're still on our main branch here. So I want to check out as our main branch. So I'm going to say git check out and I'm going to check out as main. Now you can see that your branch is already up to date with origin main. If it wasn't, you could simply go git pull and this is going to pull in all of the changes. You can see here that we pulled in our index and this adds 12 lines of code. 
Okay, so another really common problem that you're gonna come across is when you have merge conflicts. Let's go ahead and simulate one of those now. So I'm gonna git checkout minus B, and I'm just gonna call this feature slash one. Now in feature one, I'm going to update my title here, and this is going to say feature one. So let's git add dot, so we'll add this to our stage. I'm going to git commit minus M and I'm going to say beach one. And then finally, let's git push. You can see that we need to set this upstream origin again. If we go over to pull request, GitHub is going to suggest that we create a pull request. So let's do this. Okay, and so while we're waiting for our reviews and our pull request, another developer comes along and they create a change to the title of the index page as well. So let's go simulate that. So I'm going to check out as main. I'm going to git pull. Every time I check out into a new branch, just out of habit, I like to do a git pull as well, because you never know what changes there are on the origin that you don't have locally. So let's git checkouts minus B, and then I'm going to call this feature two. Okay, so feature two is going to change the title to feature two. Let's add this to our stage. Git commit minus M, and this is going to be feature two. Then we're going to git push. So the reason that we have to do this git push set upstream is because on our origin, this branch doesn't actually exist. And so we need to create it. We can set some config so this happens automatically. If you go into my pro tips, you'll see this git config global push auto setup remote true. If you put that in, every time you create a new branch, it's automatically going to create the branch on your remote origin. So let's put that in. For now, we are going to have to do this one again. So let's go back over to our pull request and we can create a pull request for our second feature. Let's create this one. And let's merge this one in to create the conflict on our original feature. So I'm going to merge this one in. Okay, so let's get checkout. And I always like to go back to main and get pull before I check out into a new branch. So I'm going to get checkout on my feet. So if you can't remember what your branch is called, you can also switch to a branch by clicking on this little branches icon down here. And you can see all the branches you have here. So we can check out into feet one by just clicking feature one here. If we go into our feature one branch, you can see that GitHub is telling us that we have a conflict. Now we could resolve this conflict in the web UI. You can see here that we could just make this change here and then we can map it as resolved and then we'll be able to commit that but we wanna be able to do this in the command line. So how are we going to do that? Well, firstly, we need to get the conflict into our local branch. So let's go back over to our main branch here. I'm going to get pull, and we should be pulling in the new index file. So you can see here that now this is feature two. Let's go over to our feature one branch. We can do a git pull for good measure. Now we want to merge main into our branch. So we're gonna say git merge main. And you can see now that we have our conflict in our local branch. So there's a few different ways that we can resolve this. And this is a relatively simple conflict, but they are going to get much more complicated. So you can see here that we have accept current change, accept incoming change, or accept both changes. So the current change is going to be the change on our branch here. So you can see that the current change says feature one. The incoming change is going to be the change on the remote origin, which is going to be what we changed in feature two, because remember we merged feature two into our main branch. So we could just remove this all here manually and then save it. And then that would fix the conflict. The other thing that we can do is we could right click here and we could say accept incoming changes. We can save that and you can see now it says feature two. We could also of course right click and say accept all current or we can click these little links here. Okay, so now that we're happy 
that we've fixed our conflict, we can add it to our stage. And I say git commit minus m. I'm going to make this a chore. Fix conflict. And then finally, I want to git push. Now, if we go over to our pull request, you can see that we no longer have a conflict here. So on a pull request, you're going to notice that we have this commits tab here. And this commits tab is going to be a history of all the changes that you made on your pull request. And now you can see why it's really beneficial to prefix your commits with what they are, whether they're a feature, whether they're a test, whether they're a chore, whether they're a refactor. Another one of my pro tips is to commit early and commit often. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you have a pull request that say changes a thousand lines of code and I click on this commits panel here and I can only see one commit, that's telling me that you're not committing early and you're not committing often. The reason that you would want to do that is because if you make small changes, commit those changes, test your code, it's easy to see where you broke something and it's easy to go back to where it was previously working. It also gives the reviewer a good insight into how you went about solving this problem or adding this feature because they can see a history of all the changes that you made along the way. Okay, so the other problem that you might want to solve is you might want to remove files from your Git repository or you might want to say, hey, never track this file, meaning never push this up to GitHub. So let's create a new file here and I'm going to call this .n and I'm going to say my secret equals one, two, three. So you can see here that we have a change in .n and it's ready to go out to our remote repository, but we never want to push this to our remote repository. So the way that we can fix this is we can use a .git ignore file. So I can say .git ignore. Now I can add the path to my .n file. So I can say .n. Now if we go over, you can see that we only have a git ignore file here and we don't have a .n file, but it still exists on our local computer. Let's git add to our stage, git commit minus m. I'm going to say chore adds dot git ignore and then I'm just going to push this straight into our main branch. So some of the other pro tips that I had were to make small concise pull requests. What I mean by this is make sure in your pull request you only have one feature or one bug request or one set of refactoring and that's because a small concise pull request makes it much easier to review for your colleagues than a large pull request that say has two or three features in it. The other reason is, let's say you have a pull request that fixes a bug and adds a big feature. If your reviewers say, hey, I don't think we should fix the bug like this. I think we should fix it this way or that way. You can't merge your feature in until you've refactored your code to meet your reviewer's standards. This is a big problem because your feature should already be in the code base as long as it is good to go. Another tip is when you start a new job or when you're interviewing, you should ask about the Git conflict resolution strategy. Some companies are going to want you to rebase while others really want you to not rebase and only merge changes. Git rebase is going to rewrite history and that's a big no-no for a lot of companies. Another thing that you can ask your team is whether they want to squash and merge, which means they squash all the commits into one merge commit or whether they keep your commit history around after you merge in your pull request. What I mean by that is you can see that this repository here doesn't squash and merge. So if we go over to the code here and we go over to our commits, you can see that it includes every single commit, including our merge commits here. Now, if you were to squash and merge, you would only see your merge commits here. You wouldn't see all these commits that you made inside of your branch. Another really great thing to ask during an interview or when you just start a new job is about their workflow. Do they use trunk? Do they use Git flow? Do they use GitHub flow? And make sure you research that workflow and ask them if there's any variations to the workflow that they might follow. So this is just enough Git for you to be productive. I've hope you've enjoyed this video and learned a lot along the way. If you enjoyed the video, please make sure you leave a thumbs up and let me know in the comments section below whether you're interviewing for your first job or whether you've already landed your first job. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.